right, look with me. John chapter 21. John 21, beginning in verse 1. Let's talk about the restoring love of Jesus. John 21 and verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, almost known, also known as Didymus, that means twin, Pastor Tyler. Thomas was a twin. Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. <clears throat> Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, don't you have any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were able, not able to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, pasture my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, shepherd my sheep. The third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him for the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, pasture my my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will bind you and lead you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. This was the one who leaned back against Jesus at the supper and asked the Lord, who will betray you? That is John. When Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people that you love so much and your presence here with us. Father, I pray that each person would hear a word from heaven today. I pray that we would encounter you as your word is ministered. If your heart agrees, would you say amen, amen and amen. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. You know what? It's too bad that Humpty didn't know the king. The last time that we were together, we talked about Simon's sifting by Satan. During the Last Supper in the upper room, Jesus warned Peter that Satan had devised a plan to try to strip Peter of his faith. Peter made some bold pronouncements in the upper room, but in spite of that, Jesus prophesied that Peter would indeed deny Jesus 
three times before daybreak. But Jesus prayed for Peter that his faith would not be eclipsed. That's the word Jesus used. Sure enough, in the wee hours of the morning, while Jesus was on trial, Peter had one of the most epic fails in the entire Bible. I do not know the man. I am not one of his. I told you, I don't know him. Cock-a-doodle-doo. Peter's failure was widely known among the disciples and the early church. His denial of Jesus is recorded in all four of the Gospels. A dubious honor. Everybody knew that Peter had blown it. But out of the disgrace of Peter's failed test comes one of the most beautiful testimonies in the Bible of God's enduring grace. Just as the rooster crowed, they led Jesus into the courtyard where Peter was standing by the fire. And Jesus looked at Peter with a gaze of love, with a gaze of compassion and care and concern. It was the very same way the Bible says that Jesus looked at Peter the first time they met on the shore of Galilee. And that loving gaze of Jesus, it snapped Peter back into his senses and he went out and he wept bitterly. We know from Jesus' words that these were tears of true repentance. Jesus called them tears of turning back. You see, that was the difference between Judas and Peter. After Jesus was arrested, Judas felt remorse and he went back to the high priest and he tried to undo what he had done. He tried to fix it himself. He tried to vindicate him himself. But after his denial, Peter simply repented. He simply threw himself on the mercy of Christ and he was forgiven. John 21 tells the story of the restoration of Peter. It happened on the shore of Galilee uh, about two weeks after the resurrection. And looking at this story, I see four things that Jesus does for us after we've failed. And I want to talk about them with you quickly this morning. The restoring love of Jesus. Four things that he does for us after we've failed. First of all, after we've failed, Jesus reaffirms his care for us. We're still waiting for our new screens to come. They're on a slow boat from China, literally, and uh, we expect them around July 1st. But in the meantime, we've printed up some sermon outlines for you. You might have received those on your way in at the door. And if you like, you can use those to fill in the blanks and follow along with us this morning. Four things Jesus does for us after we've fallen. First of all, Jesus reaffirms his care for us. It's striking to me in this story, Jesus' comprehensive care for his disciples. After his resurrection on Easter Sunday morning, Jesus told the disciples, go back to Galilee and wait for me there. While the disciples were waiting to see what would happen next, Peter decides to go fishing. John says they went out in the boat, probably meaning the boat that belonged to Peter, where the whole journey with Jesus began. There's a lot of speculation about Peter's return to fishing. Had Jesus given up on the whole Jesus thing? What, was he going back to his old life, to his old occupation? I think it's safe to say two things. First of all, I think that Peter went fishing because he didn't know what else to do. And fishing was a comfort to him. I think it's safe to say that the fishing indicated a lack of direction on the disciples' part. While we're figuring this out, let's not just sit here, let, let's do something, let's do what we know how to do. Second, I think it's safe to say that the fishing probably indicates an economic need. You see, three years earlier, Peter and John had left their nets, they had left their boats, and they followed Jesus. For three years, they were supported 
by Jesus' traveling ministry. Now Jesus was gone and the offerings were gone as well. They went fishing because they needed food. They went out in the early hours before dawn and they had rotten luck that morning. Someone once said a bad day at fishing is better than a good day just about anywhere else, but I don't think Peter would agree. Suddenly Jesus appears on the shore, but in the early morning light and in the mist, they didn't recognize him. He asked them an interesting question. He calls to them and he says, friends, don't you have any fish? But the word Jesus used means prepared fish. It means a fish stew that is eaten along with some japati, some naan, some, some flat bread. Don't you have any fish to eat there? Of course, their answer was no. Then Jesus said, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Now the command of Jesus was not consistent with the type of fishing that they happened to be doing. They were using different types of nets and fishing in a different way. Nevertheless, they did what Jesus said and immediately the net was so full of fish that they couldn't haul it into the boat. When this happened, John realized it's Jesus. He told Peter, and Peter threw his shirt on, and he jumped into the water, and he swam to Jesus. When they all reached the shore, they saw that Jesus had a charcoal fire going with some nice fish cooking on it and some nice warm bread. Jesus told them to inspect their catch, and they discovered that there was 153 large fish in the net. You know, thinking about this whole scene, what strikes me is Jesus' care for his disciples. And we are also his disciples. For one thing, looking at this story, I see that Jesus knows exactly where we're at. Think about it. The disciples are in a boat in the dark on a huge lake that had 33 miles of shoreline and yet Jesus appears exactly where they are. Jesus knew exactly where the disciples were and he knows exactly where we are. Job talked about that, didn't he? He said, Lord, you know the road that I take. You know exactly where I'm at on life's road. David talked about it. He said, where can I go on earth that your presence isn't with me, that your eyes don't see me? Jesus knows exactly where we're at and he knows exactly what we're doing and how well we're doing or perhaps not doing. Jesus knew the disciples were fishing and he knew they weren't doing particularly well at it at the moment. And Jesus knows whether we're doing well or not. He knows whether our marriage is doing well or not. He knows whether our parenting is doing well or not. He knows whether our friendships are doing well. He knows whether our health is doing well. He knows whether our business is doing well or not. He knows exactly where we're at. He knows exactly what we're doing. He knows exactly how we're doing. And Jesus knows exactly what we need. Jesus knew that physically the disciples had an immediate need for a hot meal. He knew they needed a warm fire. He, he knew they needed a break after a hard night on the water. He knew that psychologically they needed a boost of encouragement. He, he knew that they needed a win before calling it a night. He knew that financially their business needed a windfall. He knew that spiritually they needed guidance. He knew that Peter was in need of personal renewal. He, he knew that Peter needed an endorsement in front of the other disciples after such a terrible fall. And beloved, Jesus knows exactly what we need too. He knows what we need physically. He knows what we need emotionally. He knows what we need financially and spiritually. And listen, this is the best part. Jesus not only knows, but he gets involved. He guides and he provides. 
I want you to think about it. What a beautiful picture of Jesus in John 21. From the shore, he guided the disciples to a massive catch of fish. There's been a lot of speculation about the significance of the 153 fish. I think it means two things. First of all, I think it means that what we have here is an actual eyewitness account by a fisherman, John, who was interested in such details as the size of the catch and the fact that the nets didn't break. This is a real eyewitness account. Second, I think it means that this was a miracle of abundance. Just like the jars of wedding wine in Cana or the feeding of the multitudes, this was just a ridiculously massive haul of fish simply for the sake of abundance because that's precisely the kind of good God that we serve. And then on the sewer, Jesus personally provided everything they immediately needed. The fire, the hot meal, the break. Imagine, I want you to think about this. God who spoke the worlds into creation. God was cooking breakfast with his own hands for his friends. Jesus who died and who was risen again in power with his own nail-pierced hands was serving his friends. What other God worshipped anywhere in the world by any other name is like our Jesus who loves us so much that he serves us. Think about it, would you? It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. And then imagine Jesus doing this for the disciples who all ran away and abandoned him on the night he was arrested in the garden. Imagine Jesus doing all of this for Peter who denied him three times. The disciples had been without Jesus' company for a couple of weeks now. Out of necessity, they went back to fishing as a means to support themselves but Jesus used this occasion to recreate the miracle when he first met them and called them. And he used it to affirm that he still cared for them. Peter's failure hadn't changed Jesus' love for him. It hadn't stopped his care. Jesus was still there. He was still ready to give guidance. He was still graciously providing. You know, I believe the Lord has a word for someone here today to encourage you. If you've fallen short like Peter, if your faith has faltered for a moment in Satan's sifter, if you failed the Lord in some way, Jesus is reaffirming his care for you this morning. The Bible says that God draws us to himself through kindness. He prepares a charcoal fire for us in the damp morning air. He cooks us breakfast with his own hand. He guides us into achieving the wins that he knows we need just when we need them. I believe that God wants to encourage somebody this morning. You awoke this morning with breath in your lungs and his mercies are new every morning. You came to church with food in your belly and clothes on your back. You have strength in your body. You have the ability to think and feel and communicate. No matter the water that's gone under the bridge, God still cares for you and he's still taking care of you. He's still with you. He's still guiding you. He's still providing for you. And he'll continue to do so. Simply be encouraged by his care for you today. The restoring love of Jesus. Four things he does for us after we've failed. Number one, he reaffirms his care. Number two, Jesus restores his commission on us. He restores his commission on us. After breakfast, Jesus engages Peter in conversation. This is the first time that they've spoken since the upper room. 
And after Peter's epic failure, Jesus is recommissioning Peter in the presence of the other disciples. Three times, Jesus commissions Peter to a leadership role among the believers. You know, in Jesus' day, to repeat something three times in the presence of witnesses was to make it official. It was to make it legally binding. Jesus addresses Peter the most formal way that he can. Simon, son of John. So what we have here is is an actual official recommissioning ceremony on the beach. Jesus wanted Peter to know that in spite of his failure, he was not disqualified from his leadership role in the body of Christ. And Jesus wanted the other disciples to know that as well. But in order to restore Peter's commission, Jesus had to sort out a few things. And he has to do the same with us. In order to restore our commission, first of all, Jesus has to confront our pride. In John's original text, in the uh, original Greek version of the gospel, the the question and answer session between Peter and Jesus is is a lot more interesting than in the English translation. Uh, I wish I had our screens here to help us this morning, but I printed it for you in that sermon outline and, and try to follow along with you because there in, in, in the three questions and the three answers, there's an important word play that goes on. First of all, first question, Jesus asks Peter, do you really love me more than these? The word Jesus uses is agape. Agape is a superior love, a divine love, a supreme love, a a heavenly love. Jesus is asking Peter, do you really think that you love me with a superior love than these other disciples. You see, in the upper room, Peter had been a little proud. He had been a little big for his britches, a little overconfident. You remember, don't you? Peter said, Lord, even if all these others forsake you, I will never abandon you. Jesus I'm ready to follow you to prison. I'm ready to follow you even to death. Jesus, I'm ready to lay down my life for you. In the upper room, Jesus is saying, really, Peter? I have to confess that growing up in the beautiful, charismatic renewal, there were times that we were guilty of presuming that we had the corner on the market on loving Jesus. Surely people in other camps don't love him as ardently as we love him. I have to tell you the truth. When we first met Jesus and got filled with the Holy Spirit, we went to church literally every night of the week. And we didn't go because someone told us we had to. We went because wild horses couldn't keep us away. God knows that's true. But, but sometimes that can lend itself to a little bit of, of arrogance, a little bit of pride. Surely ours is a superior faith. We used to make jokes, Wes, you know them. We used to make jokes about the rapture. Other denominations are surely going to go first because the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. But you know, after 25 years, I've learned a thing or two. I've met some Presbyterians who passionately love Christ. I've met some Methodists who have faith that moves mountains. I've met some Episcopalians with the gift of glossolalia. I've met some Lutherans who are a real threat to Lucifer. I've met some evangelicals who are radical for Jesus. I've met some Catholics who are unwavering in their commitment to biblical truth. I've met some Baptists who are the happiest believers on earth. Meanwhile, I, like Peter, have failed a time or two or three. I've faltered and I've fallen more than I care to admit. Okay, Peter, Mr. Cockadoodle-doo, how about now? 
Do you still think that you agape me with a love that is superior to the rest of your brothers? And a very humbled Peter answers, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I love you with deep brotherly affection. Phileo is the, the word from which we get the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. He, he's saying, Lord, I love you with, with the deepest possible earthly affection. Jesus has to confront our pride. And in order to restore our commission, Jesus has to confirm our priorities. Jesus questions Peter for a second time. This time he drops the comparison with the other disciples and he simply says, Peter, do you agape me? I'm not asking if you love the ministry. I'm not asking if you love being a leader. I'm not asking if you love the church. I'm not asking if you love serving. Do you truly love me? You see, Peter had a leadership gift. He had a leadership calling. It's all over John chapter 21. Peter was the one who said, let's go fishing, and all the others followed him. Peter was the one who jumped into the water and swam to Jesus. Peter ran to the boat and hauled that net ashore. Peter is the one that Jesus addresses. He's the one that Jesus commissions. There's no doubt about it. Peter had leadership all over him, but leadership without a deep personal love for Jesus is a disaster in the body of Christ. You see, administratively, you might be a genius. Fiscally, you might be a whiz. Organizationally, you might be fantastic. You might be able to mobilize and lead armies of volunteers. But in the body of Christ, we must be lovers of Jesus before we're doers. Peter was a doer by nature. That's why he had to go fishing. He couldn't sit around and do nothing. But Jesus had to teach Peter the lesson that loving Jesus has to be co come before serving. Otherwise, all of our service amounts to nothing. Beloved, listen to me. Everybody look at me. This is good right here. One, I'm going to sell it to John Maxwell. He can put it in a book and make lots of money. Listen, listen. One of the things we learn from Peter is that a leadership gift is a leadership gift and discipleship is discipleship and we shouldn't mistake the one for the other. You see, Peter had a, a leadership gift but he still had a long ways to grow in discipleship. Sometimes churches and ministries make the mistake of putting people with a leadership gift on the board or in a, in a ministry leadership role. That they recognize the leadership gift, but if the leadership gift is not coupled with discipleship, it is a disaster waiting to happen. Better a simple fisherman who is passionately in love with Jesus than the most brilliant business tycoon who isn't. But listen, when a leadership gift is coupled with discipleship, it will launch a movement that will change the whole world in a generation. And that's exactly what happened. Peter, do you agape me? not the ministry, not preaching, not serving. Do you really love me? For the second time, Peter replied, Lord, you know I phileo you. I love you with the deepest bonds of earthly affection. Jesus has to confront our pride. He has to confirm our priorities. And in order to restore our commission, Jesus has to clarify the call. For the third time, Jesus questions Peter, and, and now it's starting to sink in. Peter is looking around, and he's starting to realize, you know what? This whole thing is one big setup. First, Jesus recreated the miracle 
that happened when Peter was first called the catch of fish. Come follow me, Peter. I'll make you a catcher of men. And now Jesus is recreating the moment in Caiaphas' courtyard when Peter denied him. Do you know, Peter was sitting by a charcoal fire that night in the courtyard, and now Jesus has made a charcoal fire on the beach. It's the only two places in the entire New Testament that specifies that a charcoal fire was made. Jesus is recreating the scene. Three times Peter denied him, and three times Peter asks, Jesus asks, Peter, do you love me? Peter is grieved. He gets the message loud and clear. And to make matters worse, Jesus downgrades the third question. Follow this with me. Wish it was on the screens. Question number one, Peter, do you agape me more than these brothers? Do you really love me in a superior way as you boasted? Lord, you know I phileo you with deep earthly affection. Second question, Peter, do you agape me? Lord, you know I phileo you. The third question is downgraded. Okay, Peter, do you phileo me then? Do you love me with earthly love? Peter gets the message loud and clear. The first two times, Peter says, Lord, you know everything. The third time, Peter's answer is very personal. He says, Lord, you know everything about me. Lord, you know my heart. You also know my human frailty. Lord, you know my passion for you, but you also know my stubborn pride. You know I love you in all of my earthly brokenness. You know I love you, but I'm still capable of failing you. You know that in my own strength, I could never reciprocate the kind of love that you've shown to me. Even though I muster all my willpower, I can only love you back because you enable me to love you back. Lord, I phileo you, and that's the best that I can do. Now... Peter was ready to be recommissioned. Peter and all of us are called to do th to two things. Look at me. We're called to two things. Catch fish and care for sheep. Catch fish and care for sheep. Catch fish and care for sheep. Implicitly, the great catch of fish is a picture of our call to evangelism. God has called us to go into the world and cast the net of the gospel. And into that net, God directs men and women from every ethnicity, from every social class, from every walk of life, men and women, children, young people, great and small. Although the disciples were hungry, Jesus ordered them to take care of the catch before they sat down to eat their breakfast. And then, follow me, the, the fish become sheep. And Jesus explicitly tells us here to care for the sheep. Peter, do you love me? Pasture my lambs. Watch out especially for the babies. Watch out for those who are newborn into the kingdom. Take care how you handle yourself. Take care of the example you give them. Take care of how you speak. Take care of how you handle conflict and controversy in the body. Don't you dare make one of my lambs stumble. Feed my lambs. Guard my lambs. Care for my lambs. Second question, Peter, do you love me? Then shepherd my sheep. Lead my sheep. Protect my sheep. Build a hedge around them through your intercessory prayers. Pray for them so that the protection of God surrounds them. I can tell you every Tuesday morning, our pastors, we pray for you. And we pray that all through the week, there'll be a hedge of God's divine favor and protection around you. That God will keep you. That God will bless all the work of your hands. That God will bless your families and your health. And God will make you prosper and joyful in every way. Peter, do you love me? Then pasture my sheep. Feed them good spiritual food. Three times by a 
charcoal fire, Peter denied Jesus. But three times by a charcoal fire, Peter affirmed his love for Jesus. And three times in the presence of witnesses, Jesus restored Peter's commission. Beloved, I believe that God wants to recommission us. Listen, God never wants us to fail. But if we should fail, it's something that God can use to confront our pride. God never wants us to fail, but if we should fail, it's something God can use to confirm our priorities. He never wants us to fail, but if we should fail, it's something he can use to clarify the call. No matter what water has gone under the bridge, no matter what has happened in the past, catch fish and care for sheep. Catch fish and care for sheep. Catch fish and care for sheep. The restoring love of Jesus. Can I get you anything this morning? A little iced tea, a little lemonade. Can I get you a hot cup of anything? I can get. All right, you doing good? The restoring love of Jesus. Four things Jesus does for us after we've failed. Number one, he reaffirms his care for us. Number two, he reconfirms his call. Number three, Jesus renews his call on us to glorify God. Jesus renews his call on us to glorify God. After the conversation by the fire, Peter and Jesus go for a little walk. And Jesus repeats his original call to Peter, follow me. A better translation of Jesus' words is, Peter, keep on following me. Keep on following me. You know, when I was in my early 20s, my old pastor, who was in his 60s at the time, used to say to me, Glenn, you've got the whole world by the tail. I, I didn't really understand what he meant then, but what he meant was I was free to pursue whatever I wanted in life. I had no responsibilities, I had no commitments, I had no obligations, I had no dependence. Jesus quotes a similar proverb of the day to Peter about the independence of a young man. He, he says to Peter, when you're young, you can do whatever you want. When you're young, you can dress however you want and you can go wherever you want. When you're old and married, you have to wear what your wife tells you to wear and you have to go where she tells you to go. Did you know that's in the Bible? It's right here in John 21. It's true, brothers, I'm sorry. Jesus asks Peter to surrender his independence and commit the rest of his life to giving glory to God. For the second time, Jesus prophesies that Peter will die on a cross. He says, Peter, when you're old, they will stretch out your hands. And what it actually says is they will bind them. It doesn't say in English, it says they'll dress you. It says they'll stretch out your hands and they will bind them and they will lead you where you don't want to go. It's a picture of stretching out someone's hands on a cross beam and tying them to a cross beam and leading them to execution. Early church confirms that Peter was indeed martyred for Christ by crucifixion. Few believers are, are called to literally follow Jesus by dying on a cross, but, but we're all called to follow Jesus in living a crucified life. We've all been called to live surrendered to God. We've all been called to live submitted to God's purposes for us. We've all been called to forego a self-satisfying, self-pleasing life in order to do God's will and do what pleases Him. The world's philosophy is express yourself. Jesus' call to us is deny yourself and follow me in the crucified life. Peter had a little fumble. He faltered in his faith. His faith wasn't totally eclipsed, but there were a few really dark hours. Now Jesus is telling Peter, Peter, get back to following me. Get back on the path of the crucified life. Get back on the path of self-surrender and living to glorify God. I believe that Jesus is calling someone today. If you've had a fail, Jesus is calling you, just keep following me. Get back on the path of the crucified life. Get back on the path 
of living surrendered to God and living committed to bringing him glory. The restoring love of Jesus, four things that Jesus does for us after we've failed. He reaffirms his care for us. He reconfirms his commission on us. He renews his call on us to glorify God. And finally, this worship team, you can help me. Jesus relieves us from the burden of competition. Jesus relieves us from the burden of competition. I'm wondering, anybody else here grow up in a family where there was uh, one sibling who was the golden child? You know, you, you, grew, you grew up with one brother. Cassandra, you're smiling. You're the golden child. You, you, <laughs> you, you grew up with one family, you know, in a family where there was one, one brother, one sister, and your parents always said, why can't you be more like your brother? Why can't you be more like your sister? We have a golden child in our family. I won't say who it is, but Maddie asked if I was going to mention her name this morning. <laughs> I grew up with two older sisters. And my middle sister, Lisa, was the golden child in our family. Lisa was everything that I was not. Lisa is extremely self-disciplined, always has been. Quiet, gentle in nature, polite, helpful. Lisa's bedroom was always perfectly neat. I kid you not. In, in high school, every one of her hangers was exactly in the closet that was exactly the same space apart. Meanwhile, my room looked like the Lego factory and the dirty sock factory had exploded all over the place. Lisa was valedictorian of her high school class. She was valedictorian of her college, both colleges she graduated from. I was a stellar straight C student in high school. My parents would say to me sometimes, why can't you be more like your sister? You know, I love my sister, but I just want to say, so far, I've built two churches, and she hasn't built any. <laughs> hey, Mom, my mom's watching you on live stream. Not bad for a C student. In comparison to Peter, John was the golden child. John is everything perceptive, disciplined, and appropriate that Peter was not. John was leaning on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. John was at Caiaphas' house that night too, but John had connections, so he went inside for the trial where it was warm while poor Peter was left out there by the fire. Not only did John not deny Jesus, John followed Jesus all the way to the foot of the cross. And on Easter Sunday morning, John was the first one to reach the empty tomb. Right down to, to the very end of the Gospels, right down to John 21, he is the golden boy. It is John, not Peter, who recognizes Jesus. It is John, not Peter, who dutifully stays with the boat and brings the catch of fish into the shore. It's John all the way. And now, just as, just as Peter and Jesus are walking and Jesus says to Peter, follow me, Peter looks over his shoulder and guess who's following them? Golden boy. <laughs> Peter, Jesus has to tell Peter, follow me. John is following instinctively because that's what the golden boy always does. So Peter asks, what about golden boy over there? And Jesus' answer freed Peter from the rivalry that had bound his heart. Jesus says, Peter, my plan for you is my plan for you. And my plan for John is my plan for John. I, I love you both. Don't you worry about him. You just keep on following me and I'll use your life to bring glory to God the way I see fit. Especially if we've stumbled along the way 
if we've failed, if we've fallen, there might be a temptation to compare ourselves with others. What if I hadn't denied Jesus? Maybe I would have become the bishop of Ephesus. What if I ha hadn't denied him? Maybe I would have lived nearly a century, died of natural causes. Maybe I would have been there to welcome the second and the third generation of the church. Maybe I would have received the revelation of Jesus on the island of Patmos. What if I hadn't failed him? Maybe I would be the golden boy. But Jesus wants to relieve us. Listen, this is a word for someone. This is a holy moment. God wants to help someone's heart. Jesus wants to relieve us from the burden of competition. Whatever has happened, whatever has been part of your journey, whatever has been part of your story, whatever water has passed under the bridge, whatever our failures, Jesus is saying, you follow me and I'm going to use you to bring glory to God. You know, my sister Lisa, she hasn't built any churches, but she has a powerful, compelling teaching gift. And in 30 years of ministry in the suburbs of Chicago, she's caught a lot of fish, and she's cared for a lot of sheep. God has used her there to bring him glory in the way that he wanted. And he's used me here in the suburbs of New York to bring him glory the way that he wanted. You know, Lisa couldn't have handled New York. She's too gentle. If you're mean to Lisa, she cries. And she couldn't have taken the people who live here outside of New York. So God had to send her someplace a little softer and more tender. But the point is this. Don't compare the fruit of your life and the fruit of your ministry with anyone else. You just keep following Jesus. You just keep surrendering and laying down your life and God will use you to bring glory to God, to himself in a way that, that only you can do. The restoring love of Jesus Four things he does for us. He reaffirms his care for us. He restores his commission on us. He renews his call on us. And he relieves us from the burden of competition. In just one moment for our final act of worship, we're going to share at the Lord's table. Those that are serving us, you can gather in the back if you would, please. But I want to tell you one final thing about this story. Such an amazing testimony to the grace of God. God doesn't ever want us to fall, but if we do fall, God can use it to teach us about his enduring grace. The first time that there was a miracle of fish, Peter was completely freaked out by Jesus. He knew that this was something supernatural, and he's like, I I, I'm not ready for this. I can't handle this. I don't know who you are, but I'm not in your league. You remember, do you, Peter? He, he dropped down at the great, at the first catch of fish. Peter dropped down on his knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. You're too much for me. Go. But the second time that there was a great catch of fish, this was after. Peter had failed the Lord. It's after he had fallen the second time there was a great catch of fish. When John said, it's the Lord, Peter jumped off that boat and he ran to Jesus as fast as he could. What had Peter learned about the enduring grace of God? He had learned that it's not about us. It's not about our strength. It's not about our determination to follow him. But it is his keeping love. It is his prevailing grace. It is in his enduring mercy. And so even after he failed, Peter ran to Jesus as fast as he could get there. Beloved, listen to me. If you've had some kind, some kind of 
issue in your faith. Maybe you haven't committed some great sin, but, but maybe you just know there's distance between you and the Lord right now. Maybe you've denied him in some way. M maybe you were a little stubborn and, and you knew God had wanted you to go one way, but you were determined to go another. Whatever the situation is, can I tell you, run to Jesus. Run to Jesus as fast as you can get there because he's waiting with open arms this morning to restore you in his love. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus a great big praise in this place this morning?